Hi everybody, it's Adam with HeartValveSurgery.com and this is a very important surgeon question and answer session all about coronary artery disease and heart valve surgery. I am thrilled to be joined by Dr. Mark Gerdish, who is the Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Franciscan Health in Indianapolis, Indiana. During his fantastic career, Dr. Gerdish has performed over 6,000 cardiac procedures, of which more than 4,000 involve some form of heart valve repair or heart valve replacement. Dr. Gerdish, as always, it is great to see you, and thanks for being with the HeartValveSurgery.com community today. Thanks, Adam. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so let's start with a very important question I'm sure patients are wondering, which is, what is coronary artery disease? Well, I think that's a super important question for folks who have heart valve disease and, of course, heart disease in general, because often it is in tandem. And sometimes things need to be addressed at the same time, and it's related to the coronary arteries. So coronary arteries, of course, are the blood vessels that feed the heart muscle itself. So when the left ventricle squeezes to eject blood out into the aorta and out to the body, the first branches that that blood sees are the branches that go into the heart muscle itself. So while the heart is feeding the whole body, it's also feeding itself, the blood, the blood flow into the coronary arteries that feeds the heart muscle. So sometimes it's a difficult distinction for people. Uh, so these small blood vessels then that feed the heart muscle, if they get blocked completely or partially, they deprive the heart muscle of blood flow and therefore oxygen. So when people say someone had a heart attack, it's because there was low blood flow or an absence of blood flow to the heart muscle due to blockage of one of those little blood vessels. And then that area was deprived of oxygen. And then that area can die. Those heart muscles and cells can die. So that's a heart attack. And often these things occur in tandem between valve disease and coronary disease. And there's even some overlap in mechanisms, both of the progression of disease and for how sometimes heart valves are affected by coronary disease. So Dr. Gerdish, that's fascinating. I did not know that. And maybe we can backtrack. Are there any symptoms that a patient may experience who has coronary artery disease before a heart attack? Yeah, so there are classic symptoms of chest pain or pressure, even shortness of breath, which overlaps with valve disease. And again, we might see them in tandem. So we have to try to figure out which one is actually causing the symptoms. And that can be complicated at times, for example, with a blocked aortic valve and blocked coronary arteries, what's causing the chest pressure, what's causing the shortness of breath. The other issue is that as people develop coronary artery disease, they experience those symptoms differently depending on, on themselves. So for example, folks who have diabetes often won't have chest pressure. They'll just develop shortness of breath or they might have an atypical discomfort somewhere in their chest or back. Also very true of women. Women tend to have atypical discomfort. So folks who are at risk for coronary artery disease have to have a little bit of a high alert with respect to new onset of symptoms. It might be fairly nuanced, right? Some shortness of breath, a little bit of chest pressure, and they don't put it together. So uh, coronary artery disease and valve disease have some overlap there. Obviously, the very kind of discreet, oh, I've got a, uh, I feel like I have an elephant sitting on my chest. That's kind of classic coronary disease. I'm having a heart attack but you want to get to it before that. So you want to look for those little bit lesser symptoms, less obvious symptoms. So Dr. Gerdish, I want to dive a little deeper on the overlap that you've been referring to heart valve disease and coronary artery disease. Are these two conditions related? And I'm sure the patients are wondering, does one cause the other? That is a topic that we could talk about for a very long time. I'm going to try to summarize it, but it's actually super interesting. The first kind of the most uh, obvious relationship is that the, the one that occurs on kind of pathophysiologic and histologic level, which is that coronary artery disease and aortic valve disease in an in a otherwise normal trileaflet aortic valve, in other words, somebody who's not born with an abnormal aortic valve, they have a relationship and uh, it begins with the fact that the process that occurs in the leaflets of an aortic valve is very similar to the process that happens in the coronary arteries, the atherosclerotic changes. So much so 
that uh, when folks hear that on their echo, there, there was just some aortic valve sclerosis. The aortic valve looks okay, but it just has sclerosis. It's actually a little more important than just a little sclerosis because people who have aortic valve sclerosis have a 50% increased risk of myocardial infarction, of heart attack because that process in, that is affecting those leaflets of the aortic valve is the same as the process that's affecting their coronary arteries. So that sclerosis is predictive. Furthermore, that sclerosis in the aortic valve, again, just some mild sclerosis, in those patients at about 1.7% per year, they will progress towards severe aortic valve stenosis. At the same time, it's a signal that they have coronary disease, right? So just seeing some sclerosis in the aortic valve is actually a harbinger. It's a signal that the patient should be addressing this more globally. How then do they address it? And for coronaries, for coronary arteries, it's statin therapy, so cholesterol lowering medication, addressing diabetes, obesity, stopping smoking. So it's the same kind of process. We all know this, right? We know that that smoking and elevated cholesterol and diabetes all increase the risk of blood vessel disease. The blood vessels can be the blood vessels that feed the heart. And at the same time, it will impact progression of disease in the aortic valve. So that's the first kind of obvious overlap. Then there are some kind of more subtle ones. For example, someone who has aortic valve stenosis and you happen to find coronary artery disease, but they don't have any symptoms from the coronary disease, or at least you don't think so because their heart function is normal, they're getting a little bit of shorter breath, they've got a tight lesion in the coronary artery. How do you address that? And so that kind of depends on the spectrum of the patient's overall situation. And this becomes very kind of complicated and interesting. It's a kind of algorithmic. So for example, if someone is somebody that we're gonna do a transcatheter valve for, elderly patient, three leaflet valve disease, uh, and it's a straightforward scenario. And then we do the cath and we just happen to find this blocked artery. What do we do with that? Well, early on, we pretty much treated those aggressively. Now the data has come out that, well, often we don't need to. So it depends on how tight the lesion is, what part of the coronary anatomy it is, what the threat is of that lesion. Uh, another example would be kind of the other end of the spectrum. You've got somebody who's pretty healthy. You're going to do a minimally evasive aortic valve replacement for them because they have a stenotic aortic valve. And the plan is to do this as a parasternal incision. You're not going to open their sternum. They're going to have a short hospitalization. And then you do their cath and lo and behold, you find they have a coronary blockage. Well, now in many of those cases, those coronary lesions can be dress addressed just as well with a coronary stent as they can with bypass surgery. So it doesn't automatically mean we flip to a full sternotomy, it could be someone who's best addressed with a stent and then going ahead and having their minimally evasive valve. Then though, there are folks who have the combination of fairly extensive coronary disease and valve disease. And for the vast majority of those patients, they're gonna be best served with heart surgery where they can get full revascularization of their coronary arteries, bypass surgery, often using multiple arterial conduits so we can ensure they have a good durable operation and then addressing their valve disease. There's another category and that is the patient or patients who, in whom we find that they have a problem with their valve and it's due to the coronary arteries. So that's somebody who's had a heart attack and it has changed the architecture of the heart. And then that affects the mitral valve. So you'll hear about patients with what's called ischemic mitral valve disease. And that's because the ischemic component means that they didn't, they, at some point, they didn't have adequate blood flow to their heart muscle. That heart muscle was injured. The shape of the heart changed, which meant that there was tethering on the mitral valve. Now the mitral valve leaks. It's a very there's a continuum of a broad spectrum of therapy for these patients as well. When they are surgical and we're going to do bypass surgery, for example, to treat their coronary artery disease, we want to address their mitral valve too, right? So in those patients, if we're going to repair them, often we will, we'll not only reshape the valve, the mitral valve, but we'll put a sling around the papillary muscle, which is the part of the heart that has migrated away from the valve. 
And we'll bring that up so that we can, we can reconstruct the normal anatomy between the valve and where the position of the, of the papillary muscle was. Other times we'll have to replace the valve simply because we can't bring that up enough. So if you can imagine the back of the heart after it's been injured, it can balloon out. As it balloons out, it pulls down on the papillary muscles, that pulls down on the mitral valve. If we can bring that muscle back up so that the mitral valve is working again, fine. If not, then we might have to replace the valve. Another layer to that is if that balloon has gotten big and scarred, sometimes we'll cut that scar out, reestablish the shape of the ventricle by repairing what we call an aneurysm of the ventricle. And that in and of itself will restore the geometry of the mitral valve and the papillary muscles. So there's this relationship between coronary artery disease and aortic valve disease, right? Where it's the same process. There's a relationship there where sometimes we have to address the coronaries when we address the aortic valve and sometimes we don't, or we put a stent in. Sometimes they need a transcatheter valve. Sometimes they need surgery. And then in the mitral valve, we have this really kind of difficult to manage scenario where there can be injury to the heart muscle, change in the shape of the ventricle, impacting the performance of the mitral valve. And in those cases, it really requires a team approach and sorting out the best way to treat that patient. I will add one more element to that. Often patients who have a leaking mitral valve due to coronary artery disease, but that coronary artery disease has been treated by stents or by whatever. Sometimes the first line of defense is not an operation or direct intervention. It, medical therapy helps. And the other thing is resynchronization therapy. So we have to think about layers of intervention. And that includes when I say re resynchronization, I'm talking about a special type of pacemaker that, that uh, makes sure that both lower chambers of the heart are squeezing synchronously. And interestingly enough, in some of those patients, the mitral valve gets better just by being resynchronized. So you can see that it's a team approach. You can see that you need a lot of people having a say, and you have to have someone who has a very global view of the pathology. Dr. Gerdish, I am uh, enlightened, to say the least, by that response from you. I did not know about all the complexity, all the different therapeutic approaches for treating valve disease and coronary artery disease. And I can't thank you enough for sharing all the insights that you and your team there at Franciscan and Health go through as you plan your surgical missions for your patients. And I got to just ask this question as we wrap up here is, if you're a patient and you've been diagnosed with coronary artery disease and some form of valve disease, what is your number one piece of advice for patients? Well, Adam, I, I think you said the word, it's team. So um, those of us really deeply involved in these more complex scenarios recognize that we need to work with a team of folks who have a comprehensive understanding of these pathologies. And we teach each other and we ensure that each of us is thinking globally about the patient. So it really does become not just about the surgeon or cardiologist, it becomes about a lot of other people too, because these types of disorders typically involve other conditions, diabetes that needs to be managed, uh, other conditions such as, such as hypertension that clearly need to be managed because hypertensive heart disease contributes to changes in heart function and also contributes then to the likelihood of a good outcome for a patient. So it's multidisciplinary approach. It includes obviously surgeons and cardiologists. It includes a, a team that can address all of these entities in different fashions. And like I said, sometimes it's surgery with stents, sometimes it's surgery and bypass, sometimes it's transcatheter valve with or without stenting. And all of those options have to be made clear. We really have to be able to present to the patient globally what the options are and also you know, what we would want done for ourselves or our loved ones. So in order to do that, you have to have a team of people. Dr. Gerdish, uh, I can only tell you how much I appreciate the teamwork mentality that you have cultivated there at Franciscan Health, because we have so many patients at the heartvalvesurgery.com community who have 
come to your facility in Indianapolis there and have had such great surgical results, therapeutic results with your team. So on behalf of them, and behalf of all the people who are learning from this video, I can't thank you enough for everything that you're doing there at Franciscan Health in Indianapolis, Indiana. Thank you, Adam. It's always a pleasure. And I really appreciate the ability to be able to communicate some of these educational topics to folks. Thank you so much. Hi everybody, it's Adam. I hope you enjoyed that video. And don't forget, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch the next two educational videos coming up on your screen or click the blue button to visit parkvalvesurgery.com.